Have you ever wanted to wield occult powers, decimate the French colonies, or even command vast armies of reanimated monstrosities? Well, I've got good news for you. We'll be doing all of that with today's new race, the Dread Legion. Our goal? Track down all eight books of Nagash and use their arcane magics to become the dominant superpower in the world. Can we complete this exceptionally violent scavenger hunt, or will we be crushed under the heel of a hollow-eyed lunatic? Let's find out. But first, a word from our sponsor. 14 years ago, my wife died in an airplane accident. Apparently, some lunatic replaced her plane's jet fuel with high-octane gaming supplements, which caused the plane to go supersonic and crash into the Empire State Building. These supplements contain the combined energy of 73 atomic detonations, and the only vessel on the planet no, the only vessel in the galaxy that can safely contain them is you. The anatomy of a gay mer is uniquely suited to metabolizing and disarming these highly reactive compounds. I'm begging you to buy and consume these products to keep our country safe. And don't forget to use code REGGIE for 10% off, or else something bad might happen. Add over. Our journey begins in what I believe to be Algeria. We have the Dreadlord himself, along with several reanimated Roman soldiers and someone doing their best impression of Count Dante. Very nice. I start our first battle against some Tomb Kings, and they quickly realize their position in the skeletal hierarchy. Following this, I recruit some ogre mercenaries, capture a settlement, and begin sieging the Black Tower of Arkin, the inhabitants of which decide to counter us with an exciting strategy called Starving to Death. Fascinating. After three turns, we auto-resolve them out of existence and begin building some infrastructure. This race has a lot of unique and powerful units, so we're going to rush our military development as quickly as possible. You may look at units like these and think, Reggie, it's not 1939 anymore, you don't have to take over the world. And for once, you're right. All I want is a nice little chunk of North Africa, and then we're focusing entirely on expanding our book collection. At this point, our empire is fine. It's cute, everyone is happy, and most importantly, no one is trying to kill us. However, I am prepared to sacrifice all of that for a chance to obtain magical artifacts. You see, the Tomb Kings have a primitive version of an in-game cash shop, except instead of completing microtransactions with your mom's credit card, you pay for things with human organs that you have harvested from your enemies. Personally, I think it works a lot better this way. Regardless, if we want to feed the Dread King's addiction to hype beast clothing, we're going to have to expand our empire further and disembowel a few people along the way. Now, I've learned the hard way that running around with a jackknife and carving out people's organs is a quick way to become unpopular, so we need to pick an evil target that absolutely no one would care about. Ladies and gentlemen, the French. I walked the Dread King up to one of their settlements, had him flail his arms around menacingly, and then declared war. This might look bad, but uh, that's a lot of organs. So I decided to go for it. The nice thing about fighting the Bretts in the early game is that they often don't have mounted units, so you can just run around clubbing peasants until their leadership breaks. Speaking of leadership, the enemy general is currently being pulverized by an elephant, and I think their lines are starting to notice. After 13 minutes of bullying poor people, the battle was over and Xandri, along with all of its organs, was ours. Raponce was watching all of this unfold with a thousand yards stare, but I assured her that I don't want to ethnically cleanse her empire, I need to. And so the war expanded. She was out of position, and we took Al Haik without much trouble and quickly raised a second army to defend the homeland. In response, Raponce launched a siege on our castle despite having an army that was over 50% cavalry. Scientifically speaking, this is the quickest way to determine whether or not someone is retarded. With Raponce's main army defeated, we swiftly subjugated her empire, defeating her auxiliary forces along the way. This was a phenomenal outcome for the war. However, Arkin the Black captured a settlement that I believe rightfully belongs to me. Do I have any logical argument to support this stance? Definitely not. Instead, I have an undying sense of ultranationalism and levels of territorial aggression that most closely resemble a pit bull at a daycare. I briefly considered trying to diplomatically acquire the settlement, but then I realized Arkin's main characteristics are aggressive and power hungry, and I quickly decided that it would be better for everyone if he was dead and I was using his organs to buy V-Bucks. All of our opponents thus far possessed about as much tenacity as a Reddit user who has just been chemically castrated, so I was kind of expecting Arkin to simply roll over and die. But he clearly had other ideas, because he used his Ushabdi to absolutely massacre my second army. I harnessed the souls of my dead soldiers to summon in some skeletal minotaurs. They also died instantly. This was slightly concerning, however, it's only our second army. The real battle is about to begin at Lashik between Arkin and the Dread King. The combat was a bit of a 
mixed bag. Some things went really good, other things, not so much. We formed lines of skeletons supported by elite hoplites and mummies. However, the enemies were seemingly endless, and despite abusing winds of death as much as humanly possible, we were quickly surrounded and slaughtered to the last man. Being cucked so severely by Ark in the Black made me begin edging vigorously, except the payoff I'm working towards is not sexual gratification, but rather a date with a braided rope. However, I realized this video would be far too short if I gave up now, so I clawed myself back from the void and started rebuilding my armies. Arkan obviously tried to stop me, but I couldn't help but notice that his soldiers possess an innate weakness to being crushed by chariots, and we started turning the tides. We even captured Vulture Mountain thanks largely to these little fellas. They're a shielded regiment of renown with decent combat stats, but most importantly you can activate this ability to stop them from dying for 20 seconds, which is a hilarious fuck you to whoever they're fighting at that time. We traded wins back and forth for a little while, but once the Dread King was back, the war started going in our favor. I'd like to think we started winning because of my strategic genius, but in reality, it probably had something to do with this. You see, we got lucky with a random event, and now we have a Bone Hydra. It's massive, has regeneration, and is entirely capable of incinerating whole squads of soldiers with its breath alone. Is this a little strong for early game? Maybe a bit unbalanced? possibly even completely unfair? Yes, and I don't care. We used this monstrosity to capture the Sorcerer's Island, which effectively put an end to Arkin the Black's mission to sexually humiliate me. As a reward, we were given two things, a declaration of war from several obese men and a new legendary lord. Persimius is, uh, one of these guys, and they appear to have an unhealthy fixation on rebuilding the Holy Roman Empire, because they provide some massive buffs to legionnaires, hop lights and the royal guard. That's fine though, with our chunk of land secured, we're going to need several capable armies to travel the world collecting our books. Speaking of books, it's about time we claim our first. The fourth book of Nagash gives us 250 canopic jars, increased lord rank, and better recovery time. Not bad. However, it's being guarded by a wood elf named Nicolander, who has been standing perfectly still in the middle of the desert for the past 38 turns. I'm thinking he must be pretty thirsty, so I decide to go over there and beat him to death. But before I can unleash my skeletal minotaur on him, I realize something truly horrifying. It's bad enough that he's a wood elf, but his arm army appears to be some incestuous mutant offspring, a twisted intermingling of wood elves and lizard men. I shudder to think of what exactly they've been doing in the desert this whole time and how they've been hydrating each other, but something about Nicolander's lifeless visage tells me everything I didn't want to know. I could no longer bear this imagery, so I lashed out violently and began the battle. Nicolander's army has some high quality infantry, a few treemen, and several dinosaurs. Once you get past that, everything else could be classified as annoying rather than dangerous. I took my two armies, formed a front line three layers thick, and then began poking at our interspecies enemies using some screaming skull catapults. Something about having their limbs blown off in an explosion really bothered the lizards, and they decided to charge at us. The lines crashed against each other, and I did my best to wrap my infantry around theirs. Unfortunately, there's a reason my infantry is free, because it sucks ass, and the tree men were flailing their way through the battlefield, killing hundreds every few minutes. Additionally, some ranged ambushers appeared on the left flank and began harassing my crypt ghouls. After chasing them off, we used our ballistae to bring down the tree men, and the enemy forces started to crumble. Nicolander himself was still alive, but that's nothing a few cairn wraiths can't fix. We finished the battle with 1500 casualties, but I'm thinking it's worth it because now we can finally get our first book. And then the game crashed. Reload the game, burn the forests, and assault people for their questionable paraphilias. Done. The fourth book of Nagash is now ours. To celebrate, let's kill an old man. After taking out the cult of Sigmar, our empire looks like this. A vast sea protects the west, and our bony brothers protect the east. Huh? Technically, there is a faction of satanic demons to the north, but much like my tens of thousands of dollars in student loans, I am choosing to ignore that. Now, our book hunting can begin in earnest. 
I fleshed out the Dread King's army with a new mount, a few units of cavalry, and a bone giant before sending him across the ocean to Lustria. It is here in these humid jungles that we will find our next book, being held by Mortgen Wrathbringer of Haskinesh, or for short, Morty. Morty is blending his dark elf army with several chaos abominations, which makes him a disgusting freak, but we already knew that because he's an elf. Based on that alone, he needs to die, so I landed in Lustria, tracked him down, and started the battle. I wish I could say this was competitive, but he completely failed to protect his backline from my cavalry, and once they were dead, my lancers just took turns charging his infantry from behind. His chaos giants were somewhat troublesome, but not after I introduced them to my bone giant. After seven minutes of bending the Geneva Conventions, the battle was over, and we gained yet another book of Nagash. This one increases our recruitment capacity for several very powerful units. Around this time, I wanted to get some experience for Persemius, but we're only at war with one faction, and as it turns out, they're too morbidly obese to be able to sail across the sea to us. So instead, I decided to go to them. Persemius commands an army of almost exclusively spearmen, which are very strong against large units. And you can call the ogres many things, but small is definitely not one of them. So we effortlessly established a beachhead at Sartosa and carved our way up the coast in pursuit of the 8th book of Nagash. This one increases the effect of our provincial commandments by 50%, which becomes becomes absolutely fucking insane as your empire grows larger. Anyway, to get it, all we have to do is capture Karaza Karak. And yes, I know that somewhere in the world, a real-life dwarf dies every time I pronounce that name wrong. And that makes me very happy. Anyway, after massacring the entire ogre race, I was feeling pretty cocky, and Karaze Karak was wide open, so without any forethought whatsoever, I just attacked it. The good news was we won the battle very easily, but it doesn't matter what we did, it matters who we did it to. Because I failed to realize this was owned by Scarsnake of the Crooked Moon. Why does that matter? Because he's currently the strongest faction in the game, and what is effectively six armies just showed up next to Persimius and started stretching and applying lube to themselves. We tried to escape, but after a few turns, they managed to corner Persemius and fuck him to death. The battle was kind of cool because we had all of these hoplites in a tight formation against endless legions of Zack Snyder Persians, but uh, yeah, fucked to death. The fuckening of Persimius is a Greek tragedy that has unfortunately been lost to time. But it's alright, because in the meantime, the Dread King has been making a lot of progress. We sailed him up the coast from Lustria into this disgusting area, which contains lizard men, dark elves, and some kind of geographically displaced Asians. This feels like a collection of races that weren't considered cool enough to be in an interesting part of the map, so they've just been abandoned here like lost children. And the only reason I'm even here is to beat one of them up and steal their literature. Specifically, Lord Mazdamundi of the Hexawaddle tribe. He has the first book of Nagash, and in order for us to get it, we have to capture the heart of his empire, the capital city itself, Hexawaddle. This was, again, fairly easy, because the AI doesn't generally expect a homicidal African maniac to spend 20 turns sailing across the sea just to dive bomb their capital city with exactly zero provocation. But, here we are. We now have four out of eight books. Mazda Mundi was pretty upset about this. I can say that pretty confidently because on more than one occasion he tried to kill me with poisonous blow darts. However, he came up short each time, and the combination of him losing his capital city and also throwing countless armies at me actually destabilized his entire empire, and within 20 turns the Chinese had exterminated him completely. Now I do feel slightly bad for Mazda Mundi. He was a proud warrior who, judging by his physique, deserve to die of type 2 diabetes rather than an ethnic cleansing. But in addition to claiming his Book of Nagash, we were also able to extract special resources from Hexawaddle. These golden skulls allow us to buy some very rare items from the Mortuary Cult. For example, we were able to unlock a new hero, the Hellwraith, and we also picked up the Amulet of Fasta, which has an ability that makes our enemies forget how shields work. But most importantly, it gives 16% ward save. Very nice. At this point, things are going quite well. My heroes are unlocking new spells, my income is going crazy, and Scarsnick seems to have chilled out about the whole wah thing. So I decided to push even further with my armies. The Dread King is currently making his way into elven territory for the third book of Nagash. This is the refined man's literature. Because rather than doing boring number shit, it summons a sandstorm that kills your enemies whenever you sack or occupy a new city. To obtain this, we just need to capture the White Tower of Hoeth. This is easily accomplished by utilizing our tried and true 
tactic of destroying innocent people with overwhelming violence and indifference. After storming the fields and chasing those pesky elves through the forest with my bone giants, we cleaned up an easy victory and the book was ours. Now I know what you're thinking. Reggie, isn't it a bad idea to travel the globe and make enemies with almost everyone you encounter? The answer is yes, kind of. But really, what are they going to do? Sail all the way across the ocean just to seek retribution against a man who is already fucking dead? Actually, one of them did. It wasn't the technologically advanced elves, nor the warmongering orcs. It was young Morty. You see, about 20 turns ago, we beat him within an inch of his life to claim a book of Nagash. And after the battle, he was still alive. But I figured he'd just wander into the jungle and get bit by a rattlesnake, so I never bothered to finish him off. However, it turns out he spent those 20 turns rebuilding his army and sailing across the ocean so that he could land on my southern shores and launch a surprise attack in the great desert of Araby. This didn't stop me from absolutely massacring him, but it did earn just a little bit of my respect while I perforated him with 5,000 arrows. Now, it's time to secure the most difficult book yet. The sixth book of Nagash buffs our mages, and it's being held by the Wizards College in Altdorf. This one is difficult to acquire, because usually by this point in the game, the Empire is some kind of steroid-infused, hyper-masculine sex machine, and they typically aren't too keen on losing their capital city to some dickhead with a couple of spearmen. Unfortunately, Persemius is still dead, but over the past ten turns, I've been able to sneak a new general into Empire territory. However, for once, a full whole army of undead units trespassing and marching straight toward the capital city actually triggered some alarm bells for our enemy and they had some defenders waiting for us when we arrived. Technically, my Altdorf army had almost no experience whatsoever, but I was feeling pretty invincible, and if I waited any longer, Carl might reinforce the position, so I decided to go for it. The auto battler is predicting a decisive defeat, probably because of all of the enemy greatswords, which are known to cut through skeletons like a chainsaw through high schoolers in a horror movie. But we have committed, and this remarkably gory comparison won't stop me. The battle unfolded on a fairly simple and wide open map, which was convenient. However, a few less convenient things became evident. 1. At the start of any Warhammer battle, there is an unspoken penis measuring contest that takes place based on who has the larger front line, and in this case, we are the chodes not good. The second troubling thing was that our enemies had a lot of archers. Didn't bother the hoplites so much, but my mummies spent the entire time getting smoked in the face with projectiles. Our lines smashed against each other and we locked them into a stalemate. I didn't have enough units to wrap around them, but I was able to use my chariots to punish his archers for being such undeniable bastards. This was fun and all, but it is no substitute for having all of your limbs attached to your body. And over time, we started to crumble and eventually we lost entirely. This complicates our situation substantially, because in every other case, we were able to surprise attack our enemies, steal their cities, and run off before they could do anything. But now, Carl will be expecting us, so I'm going to have to form a raiding party of at least three full armies to forge a warpath straight to Altdorf. Fortunately, we're in a good position to accomplish this, because I've completed enough research to unlock our next legendary lord. Hierophant Hophthamos is a powerful spellcaster, with an army of mummies, screaming skull catapults, and skeletal minotaurs. Joining him, Persimius with his legions of hoplites and royal guard, and finally Python Sisyphus with shock cavalry and peltests. Now it took me quite some time to transport these armies into Empire territory, and while that was happening, the Dread King was already moving towards his next target. The second book of Nagash, held by the Pilgrims of Myrmidia. This book increases our trade income by 20%, which might seem unnecessary for someone that has 30,000 gold and doesn't pay their taxes, but I am the living embodiment of corporate greed, so this is as necessary to me as oxygen is to a living human being. We track down the Pilgrims off the coast of Ulthuan. They're a Bretonian Empire mix, which theoretically gives them access to very powerful infantry and cavalry, but I recently unlocked a new regiment of renown the Black Grail Knights. And let me tell you, these guys do not mess around. I know this because their charge bonus is insane, and when I select them, the game tells me they match up favorably against every unit on the battlefield. Anyway, the fight was underway, and the Pilgrims gambled their best units on trying to kill the Dread King. Not a terrible idea, but they failed to account for his ridiculous amounts of regeneration. Meanwhile, my five units of cavalry were sending his hand gunners into low earth orbit, and my spectral hoplites were griefing the enemy front line with their ephemeral trait. After a little bit of this, this, and that, the battle was over and the book was ours. There's just two more to go. 
Altdorf, and one from the Beastmen. Following our abuse of the Pilgrims of Myrmidia, we beelined it straight for the seventh book, which gives us access to a steady supply of canopic jars and increased research rate. It's held by Abishek Bloodgatherer. Nice to meet you, Abishek. I am Dread King Book Gatherer, and I'm going to rip your skull open like a ripe bell pepper. The battle begins, and our enemies deploy their disgusting mixture of orcs and beastmen. The distinction of these two creatures is, as far as I'm concerned, strictly theoretical. The conflict quickly turned unconventional, not just because there are several spiders the size of townhouses, nor the presence of an angry man hurling boulders at me, but rather the style of combat. The beastmen deployed their armies in a disjointed manner, so rather than an organized front line, they split our phalanx apart and engaged us in several pockets of combat across the map. That's alright though, the pikemen chased down the spiders, the bone giants cleared out some cavalry, and our magic killed just about everything else. Before long, we were chasing the orcs into the river. This might not sound so bad, but remember that orcs are directly evolved from the British, which means that they cannot swim. That's why they had all the boats after all. Anyway, everyone who didn't run was decomposing in the forest. Finally, the seventh book is ours, and we've also unlocked a regiment of renown skeletal elephant. Not bad at all. By this point, our dream team of generals has a assembled outside the Empire borders. We're going to need a fallback position in case we have any setbacks in this campaign, so I started by abusing Carl's little gimp at the Siege of Fildorf. This was an easy battle, and the presence of our dread legions struck so much fear in the hearts of men that Gelt immediately proposed a peace treaty after I was done spanking him. This simplifies our situation considerably. Things are going well, and thankfully so, because if anything goes wrong here, it's going to be very difficult to provide reinforcements. You see, the end game crisis hit, and it has buffed all of the orc factions into late-game killing machines with zero morality. And Skarsnik? Yeah, he's still pretty upset with us, and he's actually encircling North Africa and blocking our access to the ocean, so we can't provide any more reinforcements to Empire territory. That's alright though, because my generals bounced around capturing more and more settlements until I found the bulk of Carl's military waiting for us in Reichland. I count one, two, three, four, five armies ready to kill us, with a sixth army in our flank in case we retreat. I position us as best I can, so instead of getting pounded by five armies, they attack us with only four. Auto Resolve thinks we're done for, but I have to fight it out. I spawned in and immediately realized this battle was going to give me brain damage, because our reinforcements are arriving in the same position and at the exact same time as Carl's reinforcements, so it's going to be nothing short of absolute mayhem. I started the fight and rushed my main army towards this point. Whatever happens is going to suck, but at least we can be the first responders and give our guys an advantage. Our enemies took the opposite approach, choosing instead to move toward their other reinforcements and group up with them before coming to get us. Anyway, each army started making its way onto the battlefield, and I had to pause the game briefly just to truly appreciate the abomination being birthed in front of me. The troops were intermingled so extensively that any use of magic would result in at least 50% friendly fire, so I settled on charging our enemies from behind with hydras and mummies. The rest of my forces formed a line and braced for the main enemy army, which was quickly barreling down on us. The enemy he charged us in no particular order, and I am not exaggerating when I say this was without a doubt the most disorganized fight I have ever been a part of. Leading Carl's charge was, for some reason, his hand gunners, with infantry fanning out in every direction while somehow managing to leave their flanks exposed. During this, rocket batteries were lighting up the battlefield with seemingly no regard for friendly fire. And finally, I want you to remember that this was all taking place against the backdrop of Carl Franz screaming for his life while drowning in a sea of 10,000 bones. The fighting went on for 10 minutes, and just when it would look like one side was getting the upper hand, we'd both get another handful of reinforcements to prolong our mutual suffering. Our enemies may have deployed their army as if they were speed running a defeat screen with bonus points for heavy casualties, but I will say one nice thing about them. They did a very good job at assassinating my generals. In fact, after 12 minutes, everyone except Persimius is dead, and even Persimius is hanging on by like 300 health. This was remarkably stressful, because without leadership, my entire army would probably just crumble. My enemy seemed to understand this because he was using his steam tanks to try to snipe me from across the map. Usually, in such a stressful situation, your general may just opt to self-destruct, but I was able to use his crown of command as some kind of industrial strength antidepressant to prevent him from killing himself just long enough for my cavalry to make it to the enemy back line and shut down their tanks. The rest of the battle really just boiled down to me spending 13 minutes slaughtering about 6,000 people. And 
and it's hard to really depict that, but here's a view of what the battlefield looked like after I was done. Yeah, it was pretty messy. Anyway, with everyone dead, we finished off some steam tanks and claimed ourselves a victory. Both sides were absolutely devastated, but with the powers of necromancy, we were able to quickly replenish our ranks in preparation for our march on Altdorf. Carl tried to stop us diplomatically, but there was nothing he can offer me that would make me stop other than his capital city itself, which is kind of frightening, because that's like being in a fight with someone and you ask them what they want from you and they reply, your brain stem. Anyway, that's his problem and we walked him down at Altdorf on the next turn. By this point, our vampiric corruption had swept across the province along with sandstorms, which started eating away at his armies and forcing them to flee. With no defenders remaining, the siege of Altdorf went off without a hitch, and with this final book, our purpose in life is complete. We now have all eight books of Nagash, and yes, it is a shame that I'm illiterate, but at least I had a lot of fun collecting them. If I play any more, the orcs will probably just come down here and kill me, so instead, I'm going to utilize the powers of quitting while I'm ahead to declare myself the ultimate victor. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.